Welcome to a game with a 4K HDR videos. I didn't even know that, you know, I'm talking about the small, what is this, um, drone footage that they shot. And um, we successfully helped the Normans. Oh, well, we... Um, sure that they um, <laughs> said goodbye and next step in our campaign is the hundred years war uh, the story is beginning in 1351 the combat of the 30 chivalry England's king waged war for his claim to France by the way Roughly, roughly 130 years later, after our story here, in the midst of violent raids and devastating battles, one tournament of champions would uphold the values of chivalry. Okay. In 1350, what we know as the idyllic French countryside was a living hell. For more than 15 years, the people had suffered at the hands of English invaders. Little did they know that this war would last for another hundred years. But through this crucible of fighting, famine and plague, there would emerge the modern nation of France. England's King Edward III looked jealously across the English Channel. Wanting France for his own, he had added the fleur de lis, the symbol of France, to his own royal standard. This was an all out declaration of war. And in 1337, he invaded. But France already had a king, Philippe VI. As the English burned their way across the land, Philippe's army and his legendary knights marched to meet them and came face to face with the English longbow. A simple weapon, but the most devastating the knights had ever faced. The heroes of France fell to storms of English arrows. The war engulfed the French countryside. By 1351, the conflict was focused on Brittany. One fight stands out as a spectacular display of chivalry and a symbol of the wider conflict between the two enemy nations. The combat of the Thirty is still commemorated here in Brittany. It was a dispute between two local families. Supported by the opposing sides in the war, the French and English commanders decided to settle it through a trial of knightly combat. Each side would choose 30 champions to fight on neutral ground. France prepared to defend itself against England's finest. Already, the French captain Jean de Beaumonneur, Beaumonneur, <laughs> Beaumonneur. Oh, sorry, I, I don't know how to pronounce this. Would enlist the thirty great fighters to defend France's claim to Brittany. On the opposing side, England's fiercest champions represented their king. The two sides would clash in an arena of chivalric combat. Okay. Intent on ending the suffering of the French peasantry, Sir Jean de Beaumanoir sent a challenge to the English commander. 
30 champions on each side would compete in a tournament for final claim to Brittany. With the battleground of the halfway oak agreed upon, Sir Jean set out to gather support from local knights. As a knight himself, Sir Jean followed the strict rules of chivalry and was expected to protect the local peasantry and ensure peace. Most medieval tournaments were friendly in nature, held for sport and glory, but the combat of the thirty was arranged between opponents mired in war. English raids had torn through the countryside of Brittany and brought great hardship to the people. Okay, so uh, the first campaign lets you play the English. Uh, now we're the French. We're the French toasts. No, that's. Damn it. Sir Jean spotted an English raiding party attacking a nearby farmstead. French knights defeated the English raiders, and Sir Guy de Rochefort joined Sir Jean's party. Uh, before we continue, we need to heal. Sir Jean's search next brought him to Sir Geoffroy Dubois, whose squires were contending with a detachment of English longbowmen. The knights would use the great speed of their war horses to charge the archers and overwhelm them. The English longbowmen fell, but the French knights knew the enemy would attempt to retake the hilltop fortification and steeled themselves for further attacks. Come on, come on, come on, 
With Sir Geoffroy by his side, Sir Jean had secured the outpost. Oh, he has a maze. You see that? He doesn't have a sword. He has a maze. Cool. And what does he have? Oh, a two-hand axe? A shield and a two-hand axe? What? Dude, who are you? Hulk? Looking to secure his honor, a young knight held his ground on a bridge in Sir Jean's path. Honorably conceding defeat in the duel, Sir Yves Charel joined the cause. So Jean entered the staging area for the tournament, where he prepared to choose which knights would join him in battle. Each knight would be accompanied by his squires, young nobles in training to become knights themselves. Uh, okay, so the English have a lot of cavalry and a couple of swordsmen. How do I choose now? We definitely need. Who was the dude that could have heal? Uh, healing was Olivier Arel. Where is Olivier? There you are. Most definitely this guy. Can we select all? Olivier. Uh, moralizes royal knights. Yes. Wait, that's it? We can't choose more? So Jean had selected oh his champions. As the sun rose, the two sides entered the arena, ready for the first round of combat. victory in the first round, the French champions left the arena to recover their strength. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, we can shoot. Oh, we can. Oh, both. Sure. That's it. Refreshed and reinvigorated, the French knights return to the arena for another round of combat. The combat of the 30 was about to decide which nation would control the Duchy of Brittany. Triumphant, Sir Jean de Beaumanoir and his loyal knights claimed victory. The combat of the Thirty had decided control of Brittany in favor of the French. Little did the two sides know, this was just the beginning of a bitter war that would outlive them all. Interesting, we just got an achievement, an extra achievement uh, for winning the Battle of the Thirty without losing more than 10 units. We lost, what, two units? Three? That should be a special achievement. Alrighty. A tournament of war. The combat of the Thirty was a bloody counterpart to the pageantry of knightly jousts, jousts, but also returned to form by... 1350, just were focused on showmanship of our actual combat. Grand pavilions hid knights ahead of dramatic reveals. An opening day parade displayed combatants in heraldic glory. Knights wielded blunted arms and competed for a rich purse. And by the way, I'm not sure if you were ever, if you ever witnessed um, a medieval festival. Um, even with blunted weapons, people can hurt themselves quite easily, especially if they joust um, on horseback with this particular weapon, even blunted. It's extremely dangerous because uh, the impact velocity strength are uh, because two objects moving fast towards each other um, crushing that's the stuff where bones break or worse um, quite many people actually died uh, even in blunted modern day jousts um, not because they hit the chest, but because the force of, well, the hit, hit, <laughs> that area, you know, the portion where your blood streams through from there to here. And, um, if that area is hit, well, you can imagine what happens. Or sometimes a little piece of wood breaks off. And then it gets very dangerous. Alrighty, um, but tournaments started as training for war. In earlier centuries, jousts were only part of the tourney. Brutal melees with keen-edged weapons were just as important. 
injury and even death were common. The most dangerous of these tournays opposed national groups of knights, especially French and English, which often devolved into pitched battle. This was the tradition revived of the combat of the Thirty. In the Hundred Years' War, the English used a terror tactic, a raid through enemy territory intended to intimidate and provoke the French into battle. It was called Chevauchet. The principal weapon for Chevauchet was fire. And one of the ways it was delivered was with incendiary arrows. Challenge with incendiary arrows? Keeping them alight. One type of incendiary arrow was fueled with gunpowder. You've got charcoal, got sulfur, and we've got saltpeter. Saltpeter is the main ingredient. The more oxygen you put into it, the hotter it burns. Of course, when it's on an arrow, when it's being shot, you've got a turbocharged airstream. The chemicals are bound together with brandy, left to dry, and poured into a linen bag. The extra long arrowhead is inserted into the bag and then tied off to secure it. It is then sealed by dipping it into boiling tree resin. This resin, which itself is highly flammable, provides a waterproof casing. It also shields the burning gunpowder so the wind doesn't put it out in flight. Now that looks deadly and I really want to shoot it. The art to shooting an incendiary arrow is timing. Too early and it will go out. Too late, it will spit at you like a dragon. That was just evil. <laughs> that was great. The word chevauchet means horse raid, and it was mobile light horsemen who spearheaded the attacks. They took gold and silver from the churches, valuables from wealthy citizens, and as much food and drink as they could find from anyone. A chevauchet was scorched earth warfare to create discontent amongst the enemy's subjects perhaps even to get them to turn against their king. An army on campaign needed a decisive battle. And a chevauchet was intended to taunt the enemy to come out and fight. Um, there is one thing that I dislike about this. Um, sulfur, fire, spitting where the fuck were her and his safety glasses and safety goggles this sh should not have been put there this video that way without some sort of this is dangerous maybe you want to wear safety glasses because of that stuff goes into your eyes it's game over. I remember a mm, friend of my family. He always split wood with an axe, not with a chainsaw. Mm, and all his life, it went without a hitch. For 40 years, something, he chopped firewood with an axe. And then, one day, a couple of years ago, one tiny splinter splintered off whilst chopping wood and landed right in his left eyeball and now he has a glass eye because his eye is gone he was always like nothing ever happened why should something happen i'm not using a chainsaw it's just an axe and it worked for 40 years yes until the moment when it doesn't it's the same with seat belts um, it's not a problem in Europe. People in Europe are intelligent enough, but if you go to the United States of America, there are people who are like, I don't need seatbelts. I never had an accident. What? 
<laughs> That's not logic. That's asking Darwin to die. Well, well, well. Um, we've seen that one before, haven't we? Yeah. Okay, we can quit this. Well, until we meet again in the next chapter.